Hi, I'm Chris Ball, Executive Director of Mashpee TV. Welcome to the Select Board Candidate Discussion. With me today are Michaela Wyman Colombo and David Wheaton, two members of our current Select Board who are running for re-election on Saturday, May 6th as part of our town elections. As there are two seats open and only two candidates running, our guests today, in reality, are running unopposed. In light of that fact, we thought that instead of our usual debate forum, we would run a round table type discussion with our candidates to talk about critical issues facing our town today. I wish to first thank David and Michaela for taking the time to join us and share their thoughts. Now let's introduce them before we get to the topics at hand. Michaela, would you like to start by telling us about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Chris, um, and to Mashpee TV for hosting this conversation between Select Board David Whedon and me. And thank you, David, and to the residents of Mashpee. I'm Michaela Wyman Colombo, and I'm running for re-election to the Select Board. I initially was elected just seven months ago. I ran at that time because I love Mashpee, its natural resources, its cultural and historical wealth, and also its small town feel. I also ran because I believe Mashpee is at a tipping point. Our lack of water quality is getting more and more severe, and there's less and less housing for working class um, folks and low-income people. These are complex and challenging issues. They require leadership, problem solving, and experience with addressing complexity. I believe I bring those qualities to the board. I've given 100% to Mashpee during these past seven months. I've worked within the town, with the town management, staff, and different boards, and of course on the select board. And I've worked beyond the town with leaders throughout the Cape to explore opportunities and solutions for the problems we face. I've been actively engaged in professional organizations from municipal leaders and have met with many residents to discuss their insights, ideas, and concerns. I look forward to giving 100% of the next three years to address the challenges that we face. I look forward to working with you, the residents of Mashpee. Thank you. Thanks, Michaela. David, tell us about yourself. Kwekwasen, Natasawis, we nata in an new Tomas, Mississippi Wampanoag. Hello, everyone. Uh, in our tradition, we uh, first introduce ourselves in our native language. So, what I've said is uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Whedon. I'm a Mashpee Wampanoag. I'm from Mashpee and a part of Mashpee. Uh, it has been my privilege and honor to serve as a member of the Select Board for the past three years. I am seeking your support of my candidacy for re-election on the Mashpee Select Board. Over the past several years, I have been committed to working tirelessly for the betterment of our town and its people. I have worked diligently to promote responsible and sustainable development while preserving the unique natural and cultural resources that make Mashpee such a special place. I have also been a strong, balanced advocate for the interests of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribal members and all residents of the town of Mashpee. As a Mashpee Wampanoag tribal member, culturally, we are natural stewards of this land. So these are my priorities in securing the uh, sustainable development um, as it relates to the impacts on our water and cultural resources while providing adequate and equitable housing uh, for the residents of Mashpee and the larger Cape region. As I seek a second term on the select board, I'm more committed than ever to continuing this important work. With your support, I'm confident that we can build on the progress we have made and continue to make Mashpee an even better place to live, work, and raise our families. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you both. Let's get started with some topics, some questions. And mainly, I'm just going to let you inform us and, and educate us. I mean, to me, as a resident of Mashpee and all that's going on, I think the most important thing, in my view, that's going on right now is our water quality. So I'd like you guys to tell us everything from, I know, shellfishing, not shellfishing, but oysters, 
helping to clean the water to sewers to buffer zones and everything in between what we're doing how long it's going to take for us to see some results and why should everybody care about this and why is it important to all of us so if you could have a discussion each of you take a turn at it and tell us you know tell us what's going on um, I, I don't care who starts but I know for me you know my grandfather raised his family on um, as a commercial fisherman and as well as so many other tribal members in the town of Mashpee and other non-tribal member uh, uh, folks that live within the Cape Cod region you know a lot of the areas it's not unique to Mashpee this problem I think it's a Cape wide problem and you know you hear folks at the Cape Cod uh, Commission often talk about a blue economy and it's hard to fathom what that looks like if we continue to ignore the current um, status of our, our waters and you know the Cape has developed rapidly over several years and decades and it lacked the infrastructure when they were building out the, the, the Cape as a region and so now we can't continue on the same path without acknowledging our past mistakes addressing those in an effective way that isn't uh, further um, strapping the people's affordability to live here on the Cape. There's a lot of generational um, folks that have lived here for generations and uh, call this place home. And not all are affluent and uh, are able to uh, withstand the high uh, cost of living um, as it rises. And uh, in order to keep it affordable, we have to be smart in our approach as to addressing these wastewater infrastructure problems. You know, the bays used to thrive with various types of um, life. Uh, scallops are essentially gone from the Cape, uh, and much of the Cape in this, uh, the, the upper Cape anyway. And eelgrass is gone. That's very sensitive to nutrient loads, and so it was an early indicator. Um, you know, some of the other th types of shellfish and things, uh, they don't thrive unless they're propagated. So we have to do our part in addressing those things. Uh, some of the other areas of concern are the uh, nutrient loads on our freshwater bodies. I want to make sure that we're not just hyper-focused on the bays and embayments, but also look at the freshwater quality, uh, water quality as well. You know, the, all these natural environments are what make Mashpee and the Cape special and they're a huge asset um, because that's a term that uh, folks are familiar with using you know in our way they're considered gifts and uh, culturally and so we have an obligation through our tribal culture informs us that you know we have to ensure that things are there for seven generations um, and not leave lasting impacts on those things so you know I try to bring my culture to every decision and uh, make decisions that my ancestors and both my future generations will be proud of in addressing those things. I appreciate everything that you've said um, and I think you hit on some of the major major issues um, probably from a slightly different perspective than I can have but I appreciate and agree with what you've said. I think that our groundwater is just loaded with nitrogen We've reached a point, as you mentioned, we've built, and you can't be a Monday, uh, Monday morning quarterback, I understand, but we've built without building the infrastructure for that building. So uh, we continue to pollute our bays, we continue to pollute our ponds and our rivers. And the difference over the past, just the past five or six years, the noticeable difference is really concerning. Typically, it should take 10 or 20 or 30 years to see the difference we've seen just in the past year or two. I don't think any of us can deny anymore that's a huge problem. And it's a huge problem for all of the KPS, but it's a huge problem for Mashpee. We have beautiful natural resources. I mean, the Mashpee River is a treasure, and it's in dire straits. It's screaming for help right now. 
um, and we need to work collectively to find multiple pieces, multiple, it's a puzzle, right? With the sewer is going to help. We need to find multiple ways of dealing with our water issues. Um, shellfish and propagating the shellfish is going to be helpful, and I know we've been doing that for a while and it's made a difference, but clearly it's it's insufficient. Uh, there's just all that nitrogen. Um, so I think looking at things like buffer zones is a small piece. Regulating fertilizer use is another small piece. And those are no cost pieces that we can, we can do right away. Um, I thought it was really interesting when we watched a presentation at the select board meeting and one of the consultants was talking about the quality of the water in the ponds and actually pointed out to us that as soon as you sewer around those ponds, the phosphorus is going to stop. I, and I thought that was a promising um, piece of information that the consultant gave us. Then it's getting the sewer around the ponds. Um, I think as we're waiting for sewering or thinking about alternative methods to use, we could be looking at the new IA systems who, uh, that are getting better and better about taking phosphorus out. They're not ready yet, but they'll be ready. Um, I think we should also be open-minded to um, recycling um, and urine diverting toilets that help recycle um, both phosphorus and nitrogen and how much less, how much water they save, which is another big piece. So I think there are a lot of things we can think about um, and talk about. And I think one of the important things about having this conversation regularly is we get to share those ideas. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I just add that, you know, we really valued uh, the late, great Brian House and the UMass, UMass uh, Dotman's uh, SMS program. And, the information that he would provide on an annual basis, you know, he, he, he annually came in and presented the state of our waters and he effectively communicated that, you know, our bays are becoming eutrophic, they're dying. And, you know, recently, most recently, the Mashpee and Quashnet rivers were listed as two of the most contaminated rivers on Cape Cod. You know, that's that's changed in just my lifetime. I'm, I'm, I'm 51 years old and, you know, back 50 years ago, those were pristine environments. So, you know, I think we have to take it serious and we have to recognize that regulations uh, to date have failed us and yes. preserving those and protecting those things. And so, you know, the work that Falmouth is doing and some of the other surrounding communities, you know, the environment is a, something that, uh, society is becoming more consciously aware of and it's 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 long overdue it's welcome it is very complex there's a lot of different uh, intricacies and in doing it right and doing it in an effective way and I look forward to working with Michaela and others on the uh, Mashpee select board and other departments and programs within the town structure to effectively address the problems and and think creatively outside of the box you know, one takeaway that I had from Brian Howe's uh, presentations was that if we do something to clean up the rivers now, the river could essentially correct itself and fix itself in roughly 10 years. The question it was going to take a little longer just because of the way uh, the, the, the river flows and some of the uh, kind of um, geography uh, and topography and hydrology of the river. Um, you know, 10 years is incorrigible. You know, I look forward to mm -hmm. seeing the fruition of our uh, efforts. Yes. Um, clean up the rivers in, in, in my lifetime. The question it, uh, I'm not giving up. I'd like to try to, you know, effectively address that watershed as well. And, and also the ponds that they stem from. Mm -hmm. And that's an important point with regard to the question it because it impacts all of Wakoit Bay. And Wakoit Bay is still, I mean, we hope all our waters are salvageable, but we're quite Bay still does have um, doesn't have any more eel grass, but it has it has more life and it's less eutrophic than Papanessa Bay. So to be able to work on both of those watersheds, I think is is critical. Um, Can I just jump in with a, a question to be, to you both? You know, I've looked at the the warrant coming up for town meeting. Yeah. There's a lot of articles there addressing water quality. A lot of people sit there and go, whoa, <laughs> you 
you know, everything from raise and replace to buffer zones, and they're going to go, oh, wow, that's, that's a lot for one chunk. In your opinions, and I know they're all important, every one of these things, but what will do the most for us the quickest? Beside the sewer, we all know about the sewer, but in our in opinion, what is the most important thing we can accomplish at town meeting on any of these articles? All right, so I, I know you said you know the sewer, um, but I think it's important to note that that is on the, it is an article um, at town meeting, and we need to think about that and ensure that we have that $12 million to complete the work that's done for the alternatives that have been put into that's phase the one, wastewater right? plant. Yes, okay. yes, um, because we're putting in more tanks, mm -hmm. which will be cost effective in the long run. And as we know, the price of everything and supply with supply and demand continues to grow. So just to jump in a second, so to complete phase one, we need $12 million above the original 54. Mm -hmm. Am I correct on that? It's the smarter thing to do to, if you're gonna build now the cost of construction as well as supply chain, uh, costs have gone up and they continue to go up. They'll, you can anticipate them continuing to go up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, instead of doing a retrofit later, putting in a uh, larger capacity of tanks and things now is going to, it's just a smarter way to do it when you're initially developing the wastewater treatment facility. So what you're both saying is this is going beyond phase one, this is getting ready for further phases, this, it's, this additional 12. Have I got that right? It's preparing the, the treatment plant itself okay. for additional. Because I, it's I not don't so think much, everybody understands. It's not so much lines that you're going to target additional areas as you're uh, bolstering the capacity of the treatment plant to do a more effective job down the road uh, as you address additional phases. Okay. Thank you. I understand now. Kayla, okay, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. So. Um, so I just didn't want us to forget the sewer is on, no, the, town, is on the town warrant. Um, and and that's, that's a big price tag item. Um, completely necessary and it makes sense given the rising cost of everything. But it's an important one. What's interesting about the other articles is there no cost. So for me it's hard to choose just one of those. The two conservation articles go together. One increases jurisdiction from um, 100 feet to 150 feet. And the second one increases that naturally vegetated buffer zone right up against the water shed or the water bodies um, from 50 feet to 75 feet. So to me, that's a no cost item that really will prevent, if you look at what um, Orleans found about fertilizer, I mean, you could actually keep 7% of the uh, nitrogen out of the water by having that increased buffer zone. Using native plants, the root structure of native plants is very different from the root structure of grass or of some of the more cultivated plants that we've been putting in. So to um, have that naturally vegetated zone would be really it would just be effective without costing anything. So you're saying 7% or did I um, hear that right? The, I'm now, <laughs> yes, Orleans and I'm wonder if it's 7 or 8% but it's right okay. around that. Um, removing that much nitrogen by, and there's, they found theirs with fertilizer use, but if you have that naturally vegetated buffer, it's going to absorb okay. that to keep that from getting in the ground. Um, and I think the, the Santuit Pond article is much the same. It's a no-cost article that really takes into consideration the rights of boaters to enjoy the, the pond, to be able to take their boats out, but it limits horsepower. So those are two things that really aren't going to cost the town anything, and that'll show a difference in water quality. I agree with everything Michaela's just stated, and very eloquently and you know supported by facts you know there are some that i think are painting the picture as you know it's going to impact or diminish your rights or things like that but i have to stress that you know the things that are being proposed they 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 don't take away your right to build they don't take away your uh, ability to um, uh, do what you want to do on your own personal property but it's just ensuring that we take into consideration the natural resources that you're adjacent to and do it in a responsible way 
So when you develop, you know, the wetland buffer, uh, you'll have to, same as you do now, if you are going to um, do anything within those areas, then you're going to have to mitigate it. And so there'll be a give and take and a negotiated path forward. So, you know, it's not removing your right to do things within areas, but it is taking into consider consideration the current status of our water quality. And, you know, increasing wetland buffers and things will, um, and vegetated buffers are, are just, they're easy ways to, to try and address, and they have a huge impact. 7% is a, a significant amount. There are other factors like stormwater and nitrogen loads uh, that are come from stormwater runoff and watershed. Those things uh, are additional areas that we have to uh, try to address in the future. But you know, these are just some things that are easy to do. The regulations have not changed in you know, probably 30, 40 years. And so they, it's time to reevaluate our current regulations and try to uh, um, structure them in a way where you, you're addressing the current issues uh, at hand. And, you know, vegetative buffers, a lot of folks, are, as you I canoe and kayak around the Mashpee Wakeby Lake and other areas, and everybody wants that clear line of sight to the, to, to the water. And it's not always in the best interest to have your lawn go right to the water's edge. And, you know, a lot of those lawns are uh, plush green. They look like golf courses. So you know there's fertilizer being applied. And, you know, you have to ha maintain that vegetative buffer uh, f for the protection of the water, which is a shared resource. And, you know, increasing um, the wetland buffer to consider the nitrogens and, and the other nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, are, are a result of septics and leach fields. Um, you know, we have to address that. And so increasing that and having um, potentially tighter restrictions uh, 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 with regards to septic systems and things uh, uh, moving forward uh, is only going to help clean up the water for everyone, which is a public health interest at the end of the day. I think an important, if I may, an important uh, thing for people to understand is the naturally vegetated buffer does not restrict a four-foot pathway to get down to the water. Um, it, people, that's completely allowable, and that will stay allowable. It also doesn't exclude any vista pruning. So if you built a house near the water, you want to look out and see the water, the Conservation Commission will work with people on vista pruning as they have been. And there's certain species that will, um, they're not necessarily going to obstruct your vista, right. but they'll thrive in the environment just because they're um, vegetative buffers and delineators between wetlands and uplands. And so, the, the, you know, if you find a company that does uh, uh, that specialized type of work, then I'm sure there's a variety of plants that, you know, are people would be amicable to planting that we can achieve both. Yes. It's, not, it's not one or the other. And if you're on the shore, um, property owners will actually find that they're more protected from any uh, storm surge. So their property is going to be protected by keeping these buffers. All right. Some great information, some great comments. Um, I'd like to move on to housing. Mm -hmm. I look at, and I don't have specific numbers, but it, to me, as a citizen, I, it seems to me that our Mashpee school system graduating class shrinks every year. To me, this is telling me that the number of families that stay on the Cape and are able to stay on the Cape are shrinking. And we all know that both affordable housing and workforce housing, which is critical to, you know, our economy, our tourist industries, and just our year-round industries, as, as we've got to do something about it. So if you could address some of uh, what we can do, what we are doing, what might be in the future, uh, you know, I think it's a good question. Okay. So, you know, for me, I, I like to use the term equitable housing because I think it's all encompassing. You know, I, I, I don't want to focus on any one uh, demographic, you know, low income, uh, we know that we have, we're not anywhere near where we're supposed to be with the 10% uh, 40B, under the 40B uh, provision. But, you know, the workforces and middle income are 
two additional areas that need to be addressed. And so when we build housing, it has to be equitable to where there's a, a balanced approach to building. And you know we can't wait for the big projects all the time that are going to just build affordable housing and concentrated poverty uh, situations. We need to be um, mindful of trying to develop small incremental housing, maybe look for ways in which to incentivize accessory dwelling units on existing properties if they have the, the um, a sizable lot that would allow for that, um, which would often um, provide additional supplemental income to help them offset some of the uh, tax increases that may be coming as a result of wastewater and other initiatives. So, you know, I think there's, there's ways in which to do it. Uh, 40B I don't think is working effectively, especially in this kind of uh, market, housing market. Uh, so, you know, it's up to us to f figure out solutions that can help that. Uh, it may be applying for additional funding through federal programs to help um, prop up some of the housing uh, related uh, agencies within the town and, and departments and programs. You know, to trying to put more money into the uh, for, um, the housing trust and uh, utilizing and seeing, try to encourage the uh, affordable housing authority to go after additional funding, um, both at the state level and federal level, I think would help as well um, in addressing some of those problems. And it seems like a really good time to be looking for money at the state level. Um, housing is um, one of Governor Healy's top priorities, so this seems like a really good time to be looking for some support with both affordable and workforce housing. Um, I learned the other day that 48% uh, of workers on the Cape drive over the bridge every day, which is a huge number of people who are making that long trip. Not only does it make it difficult for them to work here, and I know it's more difficult on the outer Cape where they have to drive all that much further, but not only does it make it more difficult for them to work here, it interferes with services, necessary services for people who are living here. That's also an environmental mess. You have um, all of that traffic going back and forth on a daily basis. So I think to be looking at both, um, as David was saying, affordable housing, or you called it equitable housing, um, I think we need to ensure that we're building both of those. I think, I don't think, and as much as I know we appreciate the summer, Residents, um, that's a big boom for our economy. They play an important role and, and, and they're, they're good neighbors. I think, however, that with the water problems we have and the way our water issues really make it difficult for us to even be building, that we should focus on the type of housing that's going to keep people here rather than on housing that very few people can afford. One of the things I think is really interesting at the state level now is um, Senator Sear uh, put forward a, an act to regulate and to restrict. Um, the, what you're talking about is equitable housing. I mean, 40B is restricted anyway, but looking at workforce housing, that if we're getting some support to be able to build it, to be able to restrict it to year-round residents, and I think that's a really important thing for us to think about. Um, his, bill wouldn't, um, his bill wouldn't mandate that we do that, but it would give us the opportunity to be able to do it within the town. That way, we're not chasing this all the time, where we're building housing and developers or are coming in to buy that housing to rent it out for short-term loan, short loans, short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's something really interesting for us to think about if we really want to ensure that we build this housing and it stays at a price that's affordable for middle class and, um, and lower income people. And with that, you know, it's not unique to Mashby, this problem. No. It's not unique to even Cape Cod as a region. It's something that's going on throughout the southeastern Massachusetts um, and New England. So, you know, we should be at the forefront of addressing the problem, come up with creative ways to address it. Uh, Michaela's outlined a few, few different scenarios uh, on how to do that. And 
you know, another way is, uh, I think it's up to the towns uh, uh, within the right. There are provisions under Department of uh, Community Development, uh, the DHCD rather, uh, to, to where towns can uh, do preferential, uh, do a preference matrix on uh, lotteries and things on how, on placement. And you know, I'd like to see more housing uh, set asides for veterans. You know, are we doing enough for veterans? Mm -hmm. Are we doing enough for workforce? Are we doing enough for middle income? And then there's low income restrictions already through 40B. You know, the, it, it's, it's trying to uh, um, create regulations and, uh, and processes that uh, support uh, the most disadvantaged and the people that need the help the most. You know, the market is driven by, you know, the cost and, and who can afford it. You know, we have to counteract that and, and, and do it in a balanced way. That's why, you know, I, I, essence, I, I use the term equitable mm -hmm. uh, to try to address it, you know, from a holistic approach, um, trying to address all the needs of all the, all the folks that need the housing. And, and the transportation, that's a huge one. You know, we're, we're, we're in a uh, climate crisis where we're trying to transition off of all the vehicles on the road and, and trying to um, create uh, less traffic and less emission vehicles being on the road. So, you know, I think if you address one issue, then it, there's going to be benefits that uh, address the larger problem as well. And Chris, it's a quality of life issue for everyone in Mashpee and everyone on the Cape. If we don't have sufficient housing for workforce housing or we don't have sufficient housing for our vulnerable populations, then it really interferes with how we work together as a community, um, regardless of means. So I think it's a quality of life question for everybody. And there's rippling effects where the, you know a lot of the local businesses are, are closing and things because they can't hire the people that yep. they need to. So I mean, you know, every it's, it, it touches every aspect of our community, and it's not just a residential issue or, or people trying to find the housing, it's also the businesses uh, need the help as well to, to ensure that staying open. Well, that segues into you know an, another topic that I had to, to, I wanted to ask you guys to address is, you know, uh, we, we know in the summer we have probably 10,000 J-1 students come in, and that's another thing. But how do we keep our youth here on the Cape? I mean, it's to me. They're they're moving away because they housing they can't afford to live here. There's not opportunity to live here, and they don't feel the part of Mashpee that I think they want to. Do. I know the tribe is doing a tremendous job with their youth and culturally and everything, and I see that through the school system, through the programs you do. And I think that we got a great school system because we spend time up there doing games and you know senior projects, well, and things of that nature. And we got a great bunch of kids. How do we get them to stay? You know, and what what can we do besides housing? You know, one idea. thing, one 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 approach I I, I see a need is the. Um, bolstering the internet and um, broadband uh, capacity and bandwidth on the Cape. You know, there's areas of the Cape that they don't have fiber, they don't have uh, broadband speed, internets and things. Internet's kind of slow because of the, uh, the number of people on at the same time. You know, I don't know that Comcast provides the fastest and most reliable service, you know, not to bash Comcast, but, you know, having options I think is good. And, you know, advocating for the state to invest, uh, you know, try to invest in bolstering the uh, internet capacity. That'll provide for uh, home-based business, internet-based businesses, and, you know, the young people are, 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 are looking at those types of things. I think as a result of COVID, we have a lot more people that are working remotely, so that's further taxing the bandwidth of the CAPE uh, internet capacity currently. And, you know, we have to, if we're going to move into the future, then it's going to require investments into uh, um, internet and broadband and, you know, the 5G and everything is a, a, a difficult topic because folks are unfamiliar with it and what exactly that looks like. But, you know, if there's a way to do it in a responsible way uh, where it's 
not harmful to our health and uh, our, our quality of life, then you know we we have to look at that to tr try to move towards the future. Everything's everything's relies on your internet infrastructure, uh, and I think that would allow for folks to consider living home. You know, and, and families are starting to kids are staying home longer. They're moving back homes in some instances. And so, you know, um, accessory dwelling units may be a way of uh, also addressing that where, you know, they're not actually in the house, but they're uh, on the property. And, uh, but the internet is, uh, I think, uh, bolstering internet capacity and bandwidth would be a way to, uh, a viable solution. Yeah, rather than to be thinking about what we once did to create jobs, um, David makes a really important point. More and more jobs are online. More and more people can work exclusively online and their businesses can be conducted online. And those are really good paying jobs that would enable people, if we had quality workforce housing, would enable people to afford that housing and to be able to stay here. Um, as I was saying earlier, and I th just think it's important that keeping our young people here, keeping a diverse population in all ways here, just adds to quality of life for everybody. It makes a community more vibrant. It, it makes a better community for everyone involved, even people who don't have children, right? Um, it, it changes the whole sense of community. But I think the jobs of the future are definitely jobs that, are, that require connectivity and um, broadband connectivity. And a lot of the future jobs, are, you know, they're STEM-based. So, you know, having a dynamic uh, educational system that changes with the um, future job market, I think, is critical to look at, you know, renewables as the direction we're going, climate crisis, addressing those things. So that's going to require environmental jobs, you know, ecological uh, career paths uh, for, for our young people, renewables, you know, uh, solar, solar is something that's developing industry. The, we're getting ready to go into the, all this offshore wind development. You know, that's going to create maritime jobs. That's going to create um, a lot of different other types of jobs uh, as a result of the offshore renewable developments being done. So, you know, having programming at some of the local schools and institutions to where they could um, tap into some of those professional career paths, and that would allow them to stay here and live on Cape and, um, you know, raise their families and, and, and things as well. Well, I think, you know, people that grew up here or people that came here, I mean, I came when I was 10 years old, I came, I said, this is where I want to live, mm -hmm. and I stayed. I th and I think for the most part, the people that grow up here want to stay. But it's finding a way to do that, that you can afford to and have quality of life and bring up their children. So, you know, your points are very well taken. Um, how about other topics? Any ideas? Well, you're talking about youth, and um, one thing I think is really important, and I remember it was just after I got elected, I was talking to somebody who had been involved in town government for a while, and this person pointed out to me, or asked me, wouldn't it be nice if we were able to engage high school juniors and seniors more fully in town government so that they were more engaged? And I think that's a really important thing for us to be thinking about. Um, I have it on my list, but I haven't, I haven't done it yet. Um, I think to be able to get into the schools and to extend the invitation to students, as I said, particularly juniors and seniors, and let them know that it could come up earlier in their careers even, to be a liaison to the select board, um, to be involved in different committees in one way or another would be really, really useful. Um, in a town I once worked, we had, um, the town council had a student representative who voted, and I think, it, I think it really engaged other youth, and I think that might be something we should be thinking about. Certainly makes them buy into and feel part of decision making. I think it's a point that uh, the select board should look at. 
town government should look at. I don't know how you go about it as far as, you know, having a voting member, but I think it's an idea worth considering. I think, you know, uh, a couple of ways in which to do that is, you know, um, promoting and supporting a, a AmeriCorps program, mm -hmm. a Conservation Corps, you know, get them involved with some of the uh, stewardship efforts that we're doing. And then also, um, you know, maybe even reaching, uh, try, try to get their buy-in and insight into the local comprehensive plan. You know, especially for like seniors and juniors that are going to be uh, becoming young adults. You know, they have a vested interest as uh, students that grew up here. And, you know, that's, that's something else that we need to, you know, finish up. It, it's a slow process, but you want to do it right. You know, uh, the town planner is doing a great job in soliciting uh, public opinion of all our residents and things. And, you know, it's shaking out to be a very comprehensive document. Um, you know, it's supposed to be updated every five years. And so, you know, by the time we get done with it, you know, it, it's, it'll be time to stop planning for the next round. But um, maybe including the, the youth of our uh, high school in some of that, yeah. you know, to, to see that there, there's strategic planning and things that go well, into it's, it's the future. future growth. Right. Yes. It's their future. And to piggyback on that, you're absolutely right. The town planner has done an extraordinary job. The planning board together has worked really hard to get as many people as possible to come to meetings. They've held meetings at various times, various places. They've done meetings on site at events. And yet still, when they look at the results of the survey, they're looking at uh, most people who completed it being, being much older. So to be able to get youth involved in that, and maybe from the start, would be really pr productive. Because you're right, they're the ones who are going to be living here. And it seems like, you know, when you go to some of these public events where they're doing crowdsourcing information and um, um, input, you know, like the one on the waters mm -hmm. and then the one on the, uh, the local comprehensive plans and things, you actually have good turnout at all the yes. all the different events, but there is one common theme that you know it's mostly your older generations that come out and contribute. Yep. So you know there is a, a, we need to do something to try to reach out and, and reach the the middle age uh, crowd and demographic as well as the young people um, at through the high schools and things uh, it would be encourageable mm -hmm. to get their buy in because right now I don't think their voices are being heard uh, or they're not engaging right. so that their voices and input is factored in. It's predominantly older generations that are kind of trying to um, think about everything. And, you know, it, it would be great to have their input. Like I said before, it's their future. Yes. Right. We are approaching in an hour. Wow. <laughs> I think we could Time probably flies. talk for a lot more. <laughs> more. It's, you know, been, for me, very enlightening and educating hour. Uh, but uh, I think at this point, we're going to need to start talking about wrapping it up. So, you know, David, I, li I like your final thoughts and closing statement at this time. So there's a few different things. And as a tribal member, you know, um, like I said, we have a vested interest. Uh, a lot of tribal members still live in town. I represent both tribal membership as constituents as well as non-tribal. Um, so I always try to walk a balance path and address everyone's concern. Though culturally, I am raised in a cultural way to where you know I, I think deeply about the environment and the shared space and all the beings that live in it. So you know that's kind of what guides a lot of my decisions and uh, my focus. The tribe, you know, from a tribal side, you know, the town's fortunate in having a tribe <clears throat> within their town boundary. You know, we bring in a, a substantial amount of money through grants and things that try to address some of the same issues the town's confronted with. And so, you know, I, I, I try to, I, I'd like to see and nurture that relationship between, between the tribe and the town uh, to where, you know, there, we have available to us federal funds. Uh, there's federal partners within the region that uh, offer technical assistance uh, to the tribe. Um, because of the relation, trust responsibility and relationship of the federal government and uh, with the tribe. So, you know, nurturing that relationship is something that I, I, I try to do moving forward. And um, 
you know, addressing the climate crisis is a, another thing. Looking at uh, mitigating uh, some of the, uh, through climate adaptation is uh, another area of focus uh, that I have. Uh, in closing, I am deeply committed to serving the people of Mashpee and to making our town an even better place to live, work, and thrive. I'm asking for your support in this important endeavor. Together, we can continue to promote responsible, sustainable development, preserve Mashpee's unique character and resources, and advocate for the interests of all residents of our town. I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve our community, and I hope to earn your trust and support as I seek a second term on the select board, and I ask for your vote on May 6th. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, David. Michaela, final thoughts? I think that, um, first, thank you very much, um, and thank you, David, and I think this format was really conducive to good conversation, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate in that. I think we've highlighted some of the major issues we confront, um, and some of the um, issues that are, we're going to have to face within the next three years. Um, I think working together, working collaboratively, having David and I work with the other select board members, I think we're making progress, and I think that's an important thing for residents to understand, that um, we're making progress towards reclaiming our waters. We're doing it in ways that we're trying to ensure that people who are the most impacted by the pricing of the sewers or new systems will be protected by no-cost loans or very low-cost loans. Um, community development block grant that the select board um, put forth money for um, a consultant to come in and help us write that for people who are really struggling to take care of these things we need to do. So I think those are all important things to keep in mind. We know that we need to take care of our environment. It's critical for all of us. Our environment is is everything in Mashpee. It's our economy, it's, it's our quality of life, it's everything that matters to us. Um, and we need to do it in ways that um, help people and move people along. I think in addition to that, we know we need to be working collaboratively, thoughtfully, and in a problem-solving kind of way to address our housing issues and ensuring that we're reaching out to Governor Healy to find out what kind of support we can get from, from the state because we need that type of support. Um, I'm grateful to have been um, a select board member serving you, the residents of Mashpee, for the last seven months. I look forward to working with you collaboratively um, for the next three years. I hope too that I've earned your trust and I would appreciate your vote on May 6th or during early voting or mail-in voting, but thank you so much. Well said. Thank you, Michaela. I would like to thank you again and wish you both the best of luck in the next term, in the next three years. On these, but I'm laughing a little bit because I know it's a big job you got ahead of you, but it's very important. Remember voters. Election day is Saturday, May 6th, and this is the first time you will not be voting at Quashnet Elementary School. This year, precincts one and two will be voting at the Mashpee Senior Center, precincts three and four at Mashpee Town Hall. Precinct five will be at the public library. Polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., so get out and vote. On behalf of Mashpee TV, David, Michaela, we all thank you for watching. Get out there and vote. We'll see you at the polls. <laughs>